Ladies Ooh. and gentlemen, welcome to Anson and Paul's Big Movie Podcast. I'm Anson Chan. I am Paul Morgan. And today we are reviewing The Inglorious Bastards. And killing them softly with a b b b b b b b Brad Pitt double feature. Whoa! Paul, where do we want to start? Uh, do you want to start with Inglorious Bastards? I'd love to. Heck yeah, man. So, The Inglorious Bastards is the 2009 film by Quentin Tarantino, starring Brad Pitt, Melanie Laurent, Christoph Waltz, and a whole bunch of other people, with um, the narrator uh, as Samuel Jackson, I believe. Yep. Uh, this takes place during World War II um, in German-occupied France, and follows kind of like the stories of The Inglorious Bastards, an American basically raiding company deployed to strike fear in the hearts of Nazis, basically where their job is to kind of strike shock and awe in, in the German lines and to make them kind of lose morale, if you will. And also just kill a bunch of Nazis. Um, it also follows Christoph Waltz, the Jew sniffer or a detective SS captain or officer, uh, sent to find and eliminate hiding Jews in France and um, the girl who he let get away named Shoshana. Shoshana Dreyfus. Yes. So that's a pretty good summary. I think that's good enough, right? Yeah. Those are kind of the main uh, people. Yeah. So Paul, what did you like about Inglorious Bastards? Oh man. Um, I liked a lot of stuff about this movie. This is personally, um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself, like, the biggest Quentin Tarantino fan. I like his movies a lot, but I, I know I'm not like some people with my fandom. But this is definitely, uh, by a very long shot, my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. Mm. Um, I liked, uh, I'll mention a couple of scenes that I really liked. Um, I like the scene where they break uh, Hugo Stieglitz out of jail. Yeah. Um, there's, this really, there's this really gorgeous point where he's sitting in the jail cell and they cut out to all the guards and then someone one of the bastards i it's a little bit too quick for me to tell who it was just really quickly runs by and just sprays a bunch of machine gun fire into these two guards and it's just like this really quick kind of like guerrilla fighting type move that i thought was just really gorgeously shot um, I really like the quick scene, um, when they, uh, introduce Joseph Ger- Goebbels and he, mm. it like shows him having <laughs> sex with his, uh, interpreter mm-hmm. and he's making like these squealing sounds that are just yeah. really fucking hilarious. And in the same shot, you can see his interpreter's face and she's like bored out of her mind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. Um, I really, really love... One of my favorite scenes is the wait for the cream scene. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but when they combine that, like, delicious-looking strudel and the cream that they get, and, like, when they stab it with the fork and they get the scoop of cream on the knife, it's just, like, it looks so delicious. (laughs) But while all of this gorgeous food porn is happening, it's just, like, Shoshana's living a total nightmare because the guy who like killed her whole family is sitting right across from her. That was great. Mm. Um, I really like the introduction to operation Kino, Mm -hmm. which is the scene where, uh, Mike Myers briefs, um, what's his name? The other, uh, English actor, actor, uh, he's, he was Michael Fassbender. Yes. (laughs) Correct. Dude, that part is so funny. Mike Myers' silly accent and his big mustache <laughs> yeah. is so fucking funny. I love that. Um, I love the underground bar scene. I think that's probably one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever. Um, that felt there's... a lot like, um, what's it called? The the movie that I like a lot. The uh, Hateful, Hateful Eight. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. In that, in that scene, there are so many different arcs and so much suspense that happens. And like, you always think that something is going to get them caught 
And by God, the thing that actually gets them caught is one of my favorite things in all of, of movie making is the making the three with his hand. Mm -hmm. I love that so much because my dad grew up in Germany and he does the German three whenever he counts out with his hands. Mm -hmm. So consequently Mm -hmm. I have always done the German three as well. Oh, nice. So when I saw him do that the first time in the theater, I was like, (gasps) (laughs) Oh man, it was just so delightful. And then also just the first, the first scene with, um, the farmer guy, and uh and Colonel Londa I thought is like one of the cooler scenes in all of movie history for me at least. It's just like a very well crafted scene with amazing dialogue and wonderful camera work, despite the fact that it's just two guys talking in a room. Uh and then I just wrote down two um quick quotes that I really enjoyed from this movie. Um, the first one is when Brad Pitt is telling the, uh, prospective bastards what they're going to be doing. And he says, it will be with thoughts of us that they are tortured with. (laughs) I don't know why, but that line is really funny to me. Um, and then at the very end, when, uh, they capture, or Colonel Londa captures uh, Udowitz and uh, Aldo Rain, Brad Pitt's character, mm-hmm. and he goes, if something, 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 and something, 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 then we are simply not operating on the level of mutual respect, I assumed. And Brad Pitt just goes, guess not. Like, I don't <laughs> know. Just like, Brad Pitt is such a dumbass, and Colonel Hans Landa is such a brilliant person and Mm -hmm. yet, and, and he respects Brad Pitt's character so much and Brad Pitt's just like, Oh, this guy's a fucking idiot. Like Nazi dumbass. Like Mm -hmm. he just does not have the same level of respect, which I think is hilarious. Utter contempt. Yeah. Yeah, So those are kind of my highlights. Um, I just think this movie is one of the more tasteful Quentin Tarantino movies. Um, like, the dialogue is all great. The cinematography is gorgeous. It's cut well. The acting is wonderful from almost every side of the, you know, almost every part of it. I love how many different languages it was in, like mm-hmm. Daniel Bruhl and uh, fucking Till Schweiger. Like they got to speak German. Christoph Waltz spoke German, Italian, French, and English, which I think Mm -hmm. is really dope. There's large swaths of it in French, large swaths of it in English. I just thought it's just an incredibly well-rounded movie and it might move a little bit slowly compared to like all of of his other movies. Yeah. Compared to some of his other movies, but I think it's like a really good, I don't know. It's just like a, a better movie like a more fully realized Quentin Tarantino universe movie to me. So that's, that's what I liked. What, what, what did you like? What worked for you in this? Uh, this is the second time I've seen it. Cause the first time I Only didn't the second like time? it. Yeah. The first time I didn't like it. So I oh, wanted no to way. give it a rewatch. Yeah. Because okay. I, um, I was like, everyone's saying this is the best one. And like, I didn't like it, but you know, I, okay. I changed my mind with, um, uh, the Big Lebowski. Yeah, and I was like, maybe it was the time, in, you know, the time I watched it. So let's let's do another rewatch and see uh, if my perspective changed. Because I sure. love Quentin Tarantino's movies. I love his full library of work, and I loved it the second time. Really? Yeah, I was like, I was like, I loved it so much. Oh man, um, that's great. This past week, I've been watching a lot of movies. And we watched, uh, me and Pat, because we, like, play games and, like, have movies on and watch them at the same time. Yeah. We recently watched, like, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, or Curse of the Sierra Madre, whatever it is, with Humphrey Bogart. And this movie has that old noir-y kind of, like, the old 1940s sensibilities, or 1950s kind of movie sensibilities, but it's completely reversed. So I was really enjoying the flip 
to what was established in the 50s were like the smooth talking hero the very smart like dapper like like a humphrey bogart character in casablanca yeah. was actually christoph waltz the nazi detective so you f- you flip the the perspective right even though he's still the bad guy yeah it's just that your humphrey bogart is a german nazi yep and they even play with that theme when they have uh the Frederick Zoller character, played by Daniel Brühl. Um, oh, yeah, that guy was such a good actor. He pissed me yeah. off so much. And he was like your classic uh, 1950s, like, heart-stricken kind of, like, soldier falls in love with the girl, right, kind of thing. Yeah. But this had a way more realistic sense. Because, like I said, it was a flip because of the Nazis, who has the Humphrey Bogart, who has the... I'm trying to think of someone who would be, like, Zoller's character. Might have been played by, like, a uh, Frank Sinatra... Not even. It's more of like a... Like a Marlon Brando? Not quite, because he's more whimsical. Gregory Peck, Kirk Douglas? Maybe like a Cary Grant. Okay, or, a Cary Grant. Okay. Or yeah. maybe even a Clark Gable or something. Sure. Because right? he has a little bit more whimsy to him. Yeah. Like the boyish charm, yep. but he's a Nazi soldier who killed like over 300 Americans. Yeah. Right? But they give him that, and he's such a nice and personable character. Yep. And... What an interesting flip thematically, right, to yeah. see that. And then you see, instead of, like, the brutality of the Nazis, you do see that with them killing the Jews, or at least in the opening scene, where yeah. Christoph Waltz, you know, has that conversation in English to prevent the French-Jewish people below the floorboards yeah. from understanding they've been found out. That's the only time you really see real Nazi brutality. Adolf Hitler still played, like, a big cartoon character where he's just, like, he's he's trying to appear more larger than life his portrait behind him in like a lot of scenes and he's just mm-hmm. kind of like this like mushy guy mushy out of shape looking guy with a kind of like a comical harry chaplin kind of like mustache whereas in all the other portrayals you see of him even in in the actual media right of his like actual videos he's he looks so much more sculpted he looks yeah. perfect for what he is a fascist dictator a very charismatic fascist dictator so they still are able to slide that in as like this is just some Nazi clown. And they make yep. Gerbil look like a complete bordering on, like, gayish, insecure, right, kind of guy. Yeah. It's really funny. Uh, they even they even kind of do a, a reversal on the James Bond scene, which I love, because the whole briefing, like you said, with the Operation Operation Kino with Mike Myers, fucking amazing. When I saw Mike Myers' name in the, in the title screen, uh, crawl in the beginning. I was like, wait, Mike Myers is in this? What the fuck? Yeah. And then I was like, oh yeah! He's, he's so good when he's having that that meeting in the huge empty like war room. Yeah. And there's just like one dude on the complete other end of the room like by a piano. Like Winston, Winston Churchill looking Churchill. motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just so comical like the way that it's shot. And it's so grand and you walk in it's just completely empty. It was just two dudes. But again, like the James Bond briefing... Plus the uh, James Bond character played by who was his name? Michael Fassbender. Um, Michael Fassbender, because in the in the uh, bar scene, it's very much like Casino Royale. In that it's like oh, we're yeah. actually we're having a card game, we're seeing each other's bluffs. Yep. But we're not doing it in like a poker sense. We're doing a fucking party game where it's guess the celebrity or famous figure you are. So much character that it's it's just so funny to see the reverse, right? And not only that, but when he's, like, telling him, now step outside with me, you know, and let's talk about this, the, the uh, Michael Fassbender to the, the Nazi SS guy who figured him out, right? Because yeah. they have guns pointing at each other. He says, oh, no, 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 no. This isn't gonna, how it's going to happen because there are five Nazis behind me. You shoot me, you're all dead. If I yeah. go outside, I'm for sure dead. I know who you are. Like, or I, you know, I know, I know I'm going to, there's no chance of me coming out of this alive. Yeah. And so rather than have the James Bond smooth suave, we incapacitate him or like, you know, it goes his way and he wins the, the, the battle of wit and persuasion. It completely goes the other way and he, he dies and they all die. It's this fucking yeah, yeah. bloodbath. Right. I so it subverts, it subverts all the romanticism of pictures of that time as well as war movies of the time yeah because the way that they show excessive violence 
the scalping scenes or just like knifing Nazi symbols into people's foreheads is yeah. so inglamorous. While at the same time, like it, the American movies that you see of the time or even like recently, they're very, very, very romanticized or sterile with the exception yeah. of things like Saving Private Ryan, which is more recent. But of that time, you know, it was more about the heroics and the everyone loves the American things, right? Yes. You don't see the brutality which is outstanding. And you see the Nazis living the high decadent life, like I said, of the 1950s noir kind of movie. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just the Nazis doing it. And it's just so interesting to see the reverse. All the different languages, as you mentioned, make this like... It's so much is like on the dialogue, the translation, and as well as the acting. Because you can't really understand what they're saying. Like I can watch a lot of like Japanese movies, and it's like this acting just feels so cartoony. Everyone's a cartoon character, sure. right? But this just had that American debonair kind of feel to it. Even though you, you you're only understanding things through reading because you don't speak French or Italian or German yeah. or whatever, right? You're just so captivated by everything that's happening, like all the all the things that are moving around the the picture or the way that things are framed or how people are sitting. Like, oh my gosh. Um, I really, again, I want to bring up uh, Michael Fassbender's character because when he's watching his war movie that he starred in, he's horrified, like, kind of reliving it, right? He's getting sick watching it because it's, for him, oh, the killing was wait, not glamorous. No, you mean the German guy? Yes. Daniel Bruhl? Excuse me. Okay. Take back everything about Michael Fassbender and let's insert Daniel No, but you Bruhl. were talking about him in the bar scene and I think you were saying stuff that was. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Very correct. Daniel Bruhl. Never mind. So I was correct the first time, but I yeah, yeah. this time. Daniel Bruhl reliving the, the, um, his quote unquote exploits makes him kind of sick because he killed so many people. And yeah. that's very interesting too because that's an, that's an interesting commentary on in the actual horrors of war, we romanticize the idea that. The Americans, or in this case, the Nazis to the Germans, were the heroes. But actually, living mm-hmm. through it, the people who don't experience it, it's not like it's not something you want to relive, right? Yeah. So that was tastefully done because they don't harp on it. They just show a couple reaction shots of him like, against like the the really old timey way of like Heil Hitler, boom, you know, like. And I was like, yeah, yeah. like you would you'd actually get that feeling in in a movie of that time, right? Yep. Which reminds me a lot of uh, the other movie we saw recently, Hail Caesar, right? Yeah. Where in the theaters, people are standing ovation to the really cartoony kind of acting or yeah. or, or movies that are of the time, right? And you're like, how could people enjoy this? Yeah. So it's, oh, it's, it's such a beautiful take. And the whole romance between him and, and Shoshana, the escaped Jew, which, you know, she could never love him. And he doesn't get that because he sh- by by movie logic and by every logic he should be winning the any girl he wants heart right yeah he, exactly he he breaks and says like I've done so much for you I got yeah. this is now like the prime spot this is the premier spot no one disrespects me like this like what is going on here and she's just like close the door and so like he says what like thinking that they're about to fuck which is completely unromantic right but it's still kind of like a French maybe like. I'm going to, uh, you cracked my shell kind of thing. I was just, I just sure. needed to be pressed hard enough. And so when he closes the door and she just straight up kills him, right? It completely blows that up too. And then yeah. she even like bends down and like, I think she might like glance back at the movie and sees him on screen and sees him dead on the floor. And just, it feels really bad for him, right? Because he wasn't a bad person, but is still her mortal enemy. And then he just straight up kills her. Like, ah, oh, so that's a beautifully cathartic kind of like in this world, it couldn't have worked. This is something reserved for movies in this movie, which is so interesting. So all of these kind of like flips on themes, I really, really enjoyed. And for that, I think it's outstanding because I don't think I've seen anything else do it so tastefully. And the, the gratuitous violence needs to be mentioned because that's where I think where I think a lot of people have pitfalls on this movie, but that was done in parody to kind of like, yeah, I, I almost light. have trouble discussing this movie with people. Cause I, part of me is like, how do you not see that of all his movies in this, vi- in this movie, the violence is supposed to be like silly level intense. Mm-hmm. Like si- it's straight up silly in a lot of scenes. Yeah, the exploding bloods and like yeah, 
even the scalping like is like just super brutal and graphic like, oh yeah it, dude like when they're freeing um sergeant hugo hugo stiglitz banow, like from yeah. prison like the run by just killing everybody and knifing them like in cold blood that's done more rather than like a a, a a secret agent style breakout. They're just straight up mur- murdering them brutally. Yeah, exactly. Which is so in contrast to how you would think something like that would go. And they even like, when they free him, like we're a big fan of your work. Yeah. When they're all standing there, like posed for the camera almost. Cause yeah, they're, they're, they're in all this, in like, frame tableau kind of like, yeah. Uh, oh man. That's done also kind of like, as like a, a nudge or a jab to the audience. It's so very, yeah, it's so very stylized. Yeah, and I think it's it's supposed to be I just showed you a gratuitous breakout scene in contrast with what should have been a smooth breakout and like a, a, a superhero kind of like introduction of like yeah. we're a big fan of your work to the straight up murderer who kills like h- killed his whole command in his sleep, like stabbing him in the face. Oh man. Again, I think the first time all of this was lost on me. I might have sure. just thought it was boring. But yeah. when I was seeing it as the the more parody piece that it was, and that's 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 really undermines how great of a movie this is put together, right? Because it Dude, still yeah. holds all the element sacred that needs or that it needs for it to work as like a, a movie of that time, while at the same time just completely dismantling every piece and kind of showing you in so many different ways, like this is so fucking ridiculous, and also. Let's see how this would be like from the Nazis. And what if yep. we are the brutal fucking slaughterers, you know? Yeah. Brilliant fucking movie. Agreed. Oh, Absolutely I also really agreed. loved the... I loved every scene Christoph Waltz was in as his character oh, stole. Dude, yeah. Yeah, they, they could not have cast that any better. And he was yeah, just a fantastic actor. Yeah, that dude deserves actor. every ounce of work he's gotten off of this movie because he is just... That should have been like a... A best picture for for Christoph Waltz, right? I know. I don't understand how. I don't. I mean, I don't think he won anything for it. I don't. I doubt it. That was such. He commanded it. Good fucking role. They they did get him in best support. I think in Django. Yeah. Which was kind of like the nod to him, like for probably uh, this movie, because the. I rarely see performances shine that much in movies this well put together, but they can't give the the fucking best anything to a Nazi. You know what I mean? Yeah. So fantastic. Like this movie is just, ah, it's, it's a testament. Oh, wait, I'm reading on uh, Wikipedia. Christoph Waltz did win the best supporting actor Academy award for this role. Oh, good. That's good. Okay. It's sad because like there is no real main actor in this movie. Everyone's no, support. not at all. So in another category, if it was best actor, I think he could have won it. He could have earned it. Oh, for sure, dude. Man, yeah, yeah he was so amazing in this movie. Fan he sent fantastic. chills down my spine in the first scene, and yeah. he was funny sometimes, and he was scary other times. Do you mind he- if I pull out my pipe? It's like, oh, or do you mind God. if I smoke my pipe? Uh, it's like, of course, make some at home. <laughs> <laughs> Big fucking pipe just out of nowhere. So funny. Oh, man, dude. Guy is just delightful in this movie. So was there anything that did not work for you in this movie, this second revelatory time? I think the guy's playing his, uh, playing Brad Pitt's Italian entourage were a little weak. Sure. I don't think they were very strong. I think the the bear Jew was a necessary cartoon character because uh, rather than the legend of the golem that that like Adolf Hitler was saying like this mythical fucking guy who goes around killing all the Nazis, the golem is clubbing all the Nazis. He's like, boom, out of the park, you know, like just yeah, this, he's just this big fucking dude from Boston. <laughs> yeah, this big fucking like baseball bat wielding kind of like. Oh man, it's so fucking funny. But when they were in the um the final scene where they're going to bomb the the Nazis in the movie theater, right? Yeah. And uh, kill Hitler. I feel like they were the weakest in that. It really distracted from the intensity 
of the rest of the movie as well as the rest of the scene. So that felt very out of place to me. But then again, like I said, the berry juice scene was very out of place for the reason of like, this is not the movie or character you think he is. He's not some sort of like Wild West cowboy stoic, the golem. He is just like some big kind of dumb character goes around loves kills Nazis. Yeah, I think I think when I think about that scene, I'm like, the idea is we show what people are saying about him in terms of rumors and then we break those rumors down by showing oh this is just some big dumb jock from boston who just happens to be jewish and happens to do what he does and it's not like that scary when they Mm -hmm. zoom out no i agree was there anything that you didn't like paul um there's nothing that i didn't like about this movie Although I will say that one thing, a thought that I had when I was watching this was like, I really think this is one of the more like just generally high quality movies Quentin Tarantino's made. But if someone were to say this movie held on to some of its moments a little bit too long, I would not blame them for feeling that way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, but that's even with me really loving like 99% of it. Yeah. Part that made me uncomfortable was when Hans Landa was uh, strangling Bridget von Hammersmark. But I think that was supposed to make you uncomfortable because it was like, we've seen this multifaceted guy and now we see like the true brutality of him. Yeah. And, you know, but that, like, every time I watch this movie, that makes me, like, deeply uncomfortable. But, like, yeah, I I think this is definitely, I, I don't really have a lot to complain about. I don't have a lot I don't, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. I don't have a lot that I don't like. Um, I like that kinda... strangling scene because it's necessary to see Christoph Waltz break character like that. From yeah, the smooth it's talker so deeply just, troubling after you've seen yeah. this charming, intelligent dude. And you already knew he was capable of it. Yeah, then, that's like, the thing is that like, like you mentioned before, it's like we already know he's a bad guy by virtue of who he works for and how much he likes his job. But at the same time, we have only seen him as like charming and intelligent for the most part. And now he's like actually embodying the brutality that he's represents it's just yeah I don't know. and yet at the same time logically you say yeah you got to kill that motherfucker yeah you know and you yeah. see the whole like the reverse detective thing the whole reverse uh sherlock holmes moment where usually he has yeah. to put the pieces together and say ah ha ha i knew this because let me walk you through this fucking cockamamie kind of setup right yeah no and exactly. what you'd hear in a radio show or the books or anything in a movie where he already, you see him get the pieces before, and it's very obvious because you know already he's figuring it out. He finds the shoe, he sees the autograph by what's your name, and it's just a matter of when am I going to snare or pull the trap on you? Because yeah. I got you already. And when and you he see knows it happen. There's no way she could know all that he knows about her situation. Seeing him work, build up to the moment where he has that punchline of what's the American phrase? If the shoe fits. Right. Yeah. To see how that worked up to that. Yeah. And of course, from her perspective, she's fucking horrified and doesn't know that he knew that from the, the, the napkin. Yeah. But we saw the process beforehand and it's very, a little bit unsettling seeing it go down. Oh yeah. It's so unsettling. Beautiful. I, this, this movie is so captivating. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I think I know the answer to this, but would you recommend this movie to people? Highly. Yeah, I also would recommend this uh, to people. I think I think I also I would recommend this to even people who don't enjoy Quentin Tarantino cuz I think this one has a much more just solid, well-rounded sense of uh itself. I would caveat this though and say this movie is excellent for those that appreciate the movies that it's trying to spoof. But I think yeah. even as a general movie, it's very good. But like I said, my first time I watched it, I didn't like it. And I, but I didn't get any of this that I got this time. Sure. I think with age and time, I've I've come to appreciate it much more because my exposure to film has grown more. So maybe to 
and it's not just sound snooty, but to those who like that are more appreciative of the movies of that age of the fifties and forties of the Hugh Grants and the, uh, Humphrey Bogart flicks. Cary Grant. Out- Cary Grant. Excuse me. Yeah. This is outstanding. <laughs> ah, my name yeah. today. But even, even without it, it's still a very fucking good Quentin Tarantino movie and an excellent oh, war yeah. movie. And if you like yeah. Christoph Waltz or think you might like the movie because of Christoph Waltz, totally worth a watch. Definitely, definitely. Oh, man. And now we move on to Killing Them Softly. Yeah. Do you want to uh, summarize this movie? Yeah. So Killing Them Softly is a 2012 movie. Uh, directed by Andrew Dominic of Assassination of Jesse James fame. He also wrote oh. the screenplay based on the book Kogan's Trade. Um, it stars Brad Pitt, Ray Liotta, Ben Mendelsohn, Scoot McNary, James Gandolfini, Richard Jenkins makes a few appearances, uh, Sam Shepard's in it for a sec, and it is about... Um, Scoot McNary and Ben Mendelsohn's characters, Frankie and Russell, who decide to rob a card game because they know that if they do, the person who runs the card game, played by Ray Liotta, will be in trouble for it. The mob who kind of calls the shots in Ray Liotta's life hires Brad Pitt and James Gandolfini to come out and kill slash send a message to either these guys or Ray Liotta's character, whoever comes first, and uh, none of it really goes quite right for anyone. And yeah, I think that's a a relatively accurate summary of the movie. Yeah, I do too. Um, So, this movie's an interesting one. I'm eager to hear what you have to (laughs) say. What did you, what worked for you about this one? I will say off the bat, I really, really, really enjoyed this movie. Okay. One of the things that stood out to me that I that I find very mentionable is James Gandolfini, a.k.a. Tony Soprano. I loved seeing him in this movie. I haven't seen all the, of The Sopranos. I stopped around season four or five. I can't remember. Because I just started to affect, like, an everyday... What are you talking about? Like accent, like a <laughs> like a regular Jersey Italian guy. I just I just was like I couldn't stop talking like this. I break into it, and like even to this day when I get drunk, I still like just settle into James Gandolfini talk, and it's not yes. good. And people were like, when I'm meeting people for the first time, they're like, "What the fuck? Are you from Jersey?" And I'm like, "We talking about? I'm from Seattle." It's like uh, it's like, it's really fucking weird and embarrassing. So I had to stop watching The Sopranos. <laughs> I don't know. I'm very. I found it very influential in my life in a very strange way. Nice. But it was really nice seeing him in in this movie playing like broken down Tony Soprano, if you will. Yeah. His acting performance really stood out. His stories, you know, his telling of his life, kind of like a little bit of like the doting glory of like a mobster of the past, or I used to be a rich guy, a, a tough guy, a big shot. Right? Yeah. That that's so believable. And he yeah. brings such an emotion to it that just is, like, so captivating. On top of him, just, like, you know, and Brad Pitt together. So, oh, man. But James Gandolfini, man, I was just so happy to see him, like, really, really nail it, right? Yeah. He was a very tragic uh, character in this movie. Yeah. And um, I didn't know until today, because I was telling my friends at work, like, yo, Tony Soprano's in this movie. It was so good. They're like, oh, you know he's dead, right? I'm like, what? You yeah, didn't he know died that? a couple years oh, ago. I'm like, no fucking way. So it makes this movie even more sad because, like, I can't wait to see him in something really good. I'll, I'll definitely go see his big James Gandolfini movie, which I guess there is not going to be one. Yep. So I'm a little sad. <laughs> yeah. But um, I really like the story, how it was um, kind of like, did you see Casino with Robert yeah. De Niro and Joe Pesci? Yeah. Where it's kind of like the fall of the mafia. Even yep. The Sopranos is about the w- waning days of the mafia. Yeah. This had that theme of the end of the mafia f- paralleled or contrasted with the f- collapse of the financial system a la the 2000s. Yeah. So that was... And there was the audio. Way they had, like the news... Yeah. The way they had like the news clips and the audio of like 
George Bush and Barack Obama and just like probably in the day news reports of the financial collapse as it's happening yeah. while they're going through this kind of like revealing decayed state of this kind of mafia world in which they kind of inhabit because they're kind of like in some some suburb somewhere there's no real big mafia presence but they do exist we learn that they exist by committee kind of like how the the corporations took over the casinos in las vegas etc yeah and no one really has a taste for blood because they don't have any strong leadership and the people who are in charge of like running these operations don't have the stomach for the protection and the kind of brutality that is needed to run this sort of operation. Right? Yeah, they're squeamish. Very much. So it's very interesting when you see the old time hitman or the actual hitman played by Brad Pitt or old hitman played by James Gandolfini, Tony Soprano. And then like um, even the the dude who played Squirrel, I don't know his actual name. The fat guy who kind of like gets Scoot McNary and Ben Mendelsohn to to hit the card game. Yeah, it exists in this in a weird bubble that's very much a shadow of his former self. Yep, because this kind of scenario could have existed in a mafia run world, right? Where yeah. if someone they knew the owner of the card game robbed his own card game, of course you'd fucking rob him because everyone's gonna think he did it, right? Yep. Well, at the same time, the very fact. That Ray Liotta's character fucking robbed his own card game with all of those, like, mafia dudes or, like, really shady characters. You see, like, straight-up Russian mafia people in the card game, right? Yeah. And and tells them to their face, I robbed the card game a while later. It's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Yeah. There's no central authority. Even when they were, like, going around trying to beat the shit out of people to try to figure out who robbed the card game. After they beat up Ray Liotta a bit, they go, eh, alright. Hey, you want a beer? Because, like, they didn't want to fucking kill him or anything, right? Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> lighting not a that fire dedicated under anybody's job. ass. Exactly. It's, just, it's all, like, done with half measures, which yeah. allows this to kind of spiral out of control, which I, I guess is kind of like a commentary on the collapse of the financial system in a weird, obtuse way. Oh, I never really thought about that. That's kind of funny. I, I think that's a stretch, though. But sure. because they're overlaying the audio and the news while it's happening with this. Sure. Because it's, it's very, very hard to draw, like, literal parallels with it. But yeah. I think conceptually it stands, right? Definitely. Or, like, kind of banks running out of control, maybe. I don't know. But the banks never really had the authority, or the government never really had the authority, like the mafia did, to rein it in. So that's where the, the analogy dies, right? Yeah. The only way that that stands is... Uh, someone took advantage of the game, caused a collapse because all the card games and everywhere else in the whole city kind of like died because of this. But then business goes back to normal. Yep. So that could be a foretelling of the future. Like the next time this happens, heads will roll. But that's such a fucking stretch, right? Yeah. Anyway, I thought the themes were really interesting. I really liked Ben Mendelsohn, his acting. Oh, dude. Yeah, he was great. I always fall in love with... um really interesting accents right yeah and i've always had a thing for Is australian, a heavy accents. australian accent oh yeah it's like it's just so authentic and awesome because i grew up watching a lot of steve Irwin, as as you may know i'm not sure as some people may know i always love that accent oh yeah when i hear that accent like and remember when we talked about suicide squad and there's that one australian dude captain yeah. boomerang yeah. i was like ooh, you know i was like hey is a cool australian dude Yep, like, I I love that accent, man. I would yeah, it's I would one of move, my favorites. I'd move to Melbourne, play some cricket. Melbourne, Melbourne, get an accent, roast some shrimp on the babby. Yeah, dude. Anyway, I thought um, I thought the performance is really cool. I really like the the camera work. Yeah, the way they were able to build tension with kind of like the slow pace. Oh my god, nothing, no movie can build tension like a crime movie, and this movie exemplifies that. Oh, yeah, dude. Pretty much all I wrote in my notes were, like, moments where it felt tense to me. And they do such a fucking good job. Yeah. When they're planning the card game thing, which is really quick, really. When they uh, rob the card game, holy fuck. Oh, yeah. It was so tense. Like, you just don't know who's pulling a gun. And then, like, I was just like, oh, they're getting fucking greedy. They're asking for shit. Because, like, asking them to put their wallets... On the fucking table. You're oh, asking God. them to reach into their fucking pockets. They're going to shoot you. Yeah. You know, oh but like, but at the same time, you can't shoot the guy who has literally 
the sawed off shotgun of fucking hell that will kill everyone <laughs> yeah. in the room. <laughs> that would kill everyone in the room if he pulled the yeah. trigger. Yeah, it's like, this is gonna kill everyone if I have to shoot this. It's like, well, tell him that. It's like, dude, <laughs> it's so funny. Dude, yeah. When they're going around town, like, when they beat up Ray Liotta, when they're shooting people, you know, or like, they're, they're getting the guys that robbed the card game. All these tense moments. When Tony Soprano have, is having his, like, speeches or just, like, whenever he was talking, it was very tense. When yeah. Brad Pitt was talking to Richard Jenkins, the driver in this movie. Yep. That was even tense. There was, like, there was very little low points in this. They're, they're able to spin you along so well without it being drawn out, tired, or, like, cheesy. Yeah. It just feels very real, and you feel a real sense of danger and urgency, right? Yep. Beautiful. I think this is the best portrayal they've ever had, in, that I've seen of, at least, of someone on drugs, right? Oh, when, fuck. Yeah, dude. When Ben Mendelsohn and uh, Scoot McNary are shooting heroin and smoking, like, yeah. the way that they get that across, like, this is a guy high, and he's kind of drifting, the the voice is getting slow, yeah. and he's just almost seeing blurs, and he's like, snap, 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 like, come on, wake up! And you just kind of see him snap back a little bit, but then, like, it fades back to him, like, going back there. In. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Oh, yeah. And, like, he's talking in slow motion. Yeah. I thought that was so beautifully done. Like, Dude, it was there's so a, great. That I've, For that scene alone, this movie deserves, like, a lot of, like, I will turn you to this as the prime example of, or as yeah. the, the movie that did this the right way. Yeah. But I, I don't, I, I can't recall any other movies I've seen do something like this to that effect. Yeah, seriously. And one thing, I talk about this a lot to those of, who are listening who know me, so I'm apologizing up, up front for talking about this again, but I have chronic kidney stones, and they give me this stuff called Dilaudid when I have to go to the hospital for it, and Dilaudid is a few degrees stronger than heroin. Oh my and fucking that, god. And that scene is like exactly what it feels like to be on Dilaudid. It's like... You're just in this daze, and then someone will, like, say something will, like, snap you out of it, but whatever you say in response, it seems like it's just going, like, a fraction of the speed out of your mouth, and you can't... You don't really get much memory of, like, most conversations you have when you're on it. It feels mm-hmm. like time is just going, like, lightning speed, because you, like, open your eyes one second, it's, like, noon open your eyes again it's like 3 p.m it's it's really bad and i hate the fuck out of it but that is legit that sounds pretty cool to me man it's it's legitimately (laughs) what it feels like to be on that shit in the hospital so i thought you know have i've never done heroin or anything but they tell me this stuff is a lot stronger than heroin so i assume the experiences are similar and that's exactly what it's like to me at least are you at risk of developing a habit from it if it's that strong? Yeah, actually, one thing I talk to my therapist about is that I'm, like, legitimately afraid of becoming addicted to something like that, even though I'm not. Your life is ruined as soon as you yeah, get Yeah, it's done, like, like a, if I a, ever was to get addicted, I w- that would be, like, the end for me, pretty much. Like, the opiate addictions don't go away. They, they linger forever. Yeah, exactly. So it's And like... the, yeah... Those are the dudes, like like a meth addict, where they'll just get like desperate for that fix. Like, yeah, you're just you're out of control when you get like fucked on that kind of stuff. No, exactly. And so my doctor and my therapist say that it's a good thing I'm very scared of being addicted because people who don't keep that in mind are at a greater risk of uh, developing some sort of yeah. dependence. Because you're so, not yeah. looking to that Dilaudid as an escape. You're actually yeah, in it's fact, like my very pain conscious. Relief. Yeah, you're very conscious of the consequences it has, and so yeah. you kind of you take your medicine. Basically, you're not you're not gonna like jump in and like whoa, here we go. You know exactly, I mean? and also yeah. another thing is is that like I have the personality where it's like I hate not being able to do stuff, and this stuff makes me feel like not doing anything, and I hate that feeling. So I think that's another positive thing too. Is it like. I hate that it makes me not able to do shit because I like being busy a lot. Sure. But yeah, uh, just a great fucking job on that scene mm. with the feel of those sorts of drugs, at least in my experience. On on that drug topic, one of the plan of um, Ben Mendelsohn, yeah. uh, the Australian guy, 
It's like once I do the score, I'm gonna buy some smack and then I'm gonna start selling it. Right. Yep. You think that's a I'm pretty practical a idea? Dela. Yeah. <laughs> Dela. Uh, so you think that's a, that's a pretty decent idea, it's a decent plan. Yeah, right? exactly. But then when you see him just like abusing his own stash, just getting smacked out of his mind, it's like I didn't see it coming because it was still stringing me along as a good story. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I, was, I wasn't thinking. Oh, he's totally gonna abuse his stash. When it happened, yep. I was like, oh, this was logical. This yep. is totally what's happening. And then of course he gets busted for it because he didn't know how to run it, and he was just getting high all the time. Yeah. So he was not he was not uh, business minded enough to kind of like handle what he was trying to do. Yeah, he's right. just super inept at everything. And like, maybe that's an allegory of people embezzling from their own company. <laughs> Possibly. The dude was just inept at everything. He like brought the fucking dish gloves to the robbery. It's hilarious. They're they're like <laughs> robbing off the shotgun all the way to the shotgun shells. <laughs> it just didn't have a barrel. Yeah. Just a it's fucking, like the dude is a fucking idiot and somehow he's able to get by in life. They didn't even have like proper ski masks they had pantyhose <laughs> yeah, and like you could see totally their see their face through it but it was all smushed up so it was so fucking weird oh, like man. it did the job but it was yeah. like, are you fucking kidding me this it was such a bad job dude yeah it's hilarious and i i i, I love the realism of this movie the violence oh, yeah. felt very real yeah this movie strikes me as very uh Grounded. Life, like just these characters are so interesting and like true to life and stuff like yeah. that. And... and the characters were also so fucking strong, as yeah. to be mentioned. Oh man, because Scoot McNary was a strong character. Brad Pitt's a strong character. James Gandolfini's a strong character. Ray Liotta was a very strong character. Anyone that they spent a little bit of time on was a strong character. Yeah, and that's a testament to the writing and to the acting. Yep. But also back to the realism. The situations they find themselves in are very real. You see, like this, this could totally happen. Or like, again, the violence when you see Ray Liotta getting the shit beaten out of him. Like, who did this? You gotta beat the shit out of you. That felt very real because it was it was pretty brutal, man. Like when they when they kicked his head a couple times when he was down, I'm like, he, they might have just fucking killed him, right? Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised that when he wakes up, he's dead. Or when they find out he they killed him, they're like, oh well, whoops. Brad Pitt was a very stoic and real character he's like we should just fucking kill him we don't need to send him a message by beating him yeah whether or not he did it he's got to die for this just beating him for it is just needless um it's cruel because we're gonna kill him anyway we're gonna why make him suffer for this you know yeah and brad pitt knows like the politics of the mob so he's like not bothered by the fact that this has to happen and then when they were talking about like, hitting him, hitting Ray Liotta, he's still like a little soft hearted and was like, I know we got to do this, but I don't want to be the guy that has to pull this trigger because it gets messy. They get very emotional. They'll plead for their their life. They call for their mommies. It's very, I don't know what he said. I don't think he said it was embarrassing because that kind of like deflates the emotional impact that he was trying to tell the driver, like, this is not pretty. And when you see your, like someone that you know and that you're a friend with do this, you don't want to see it happen. Yeah, exactly. So I thought that was a really nice humanizing element without being ham fisty of like recently, uh, or in recent movies, Clint Eastwood has come out with like Western movies that are like anti Western or anti the Western cowboy hero that he used to be kind of thing. Like this, this job sucks. Oh, I, you hurt people. And no, no, no. they do it in such a weird cartoony off way that it really yeah. feels awkward in this that felt very sincere and they didn't dote on it. They just yeah. let that slide in and you just kind of feel sad because you're like, yeah, that would suck. Everything when they say it, you go, yeah, that would happen. Or yeah, you got to kill that guy. Yeah. Or I'd be scared shitless. Like all, all everything. You're, you're just very empathetic toward the, the motions of the movie. But yeah, for all of those things, the, the shot choices, the location, everything. Oh, dude, Amazing, I like the movie. I yeah. just looked <laughs> up the. Saying, uh, I just looked up the uh, quote, and it it goes, "You ever kill anyone? It can get touchy feely." And he goes, "Touchy feely," he says, "Emotional, not fun. A lot of fuss. They cry, they plead, they beg, they piss themselves, they call for their mothers. It gets embarrassing." Okay, so he did say that. I like to kill them softly from a distance, 
Not close enough for feelings. Don't like feelings. Don't want to think about them. Yep. Just, ah. Uh, yeah. I love and that. The, my reaction now is just like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> like, I thought yeah. it, man, I don't want to get up close. I'm not so, I wouldn't consider myself so, what's the word? Cold hearted or uh, sadistic. Yeah. Where I'd want to enjoy the torture or enjoy the killing. You know what I mean? Just yeah, exactly. Get You're... that job done, especially if he's your friend. He just yeah, he just knows it's like something that in the grand scheme of things it has to happen. It got to get like, done for the business. Yeah, exactly. He's like in yeah. it for the business and he doesn't want to bullshit around it. Yeah. I liked the speech at the end too. I thought that was a really weird tonal shift though by the very end. Everything leading up to the ending was in my opinion fantastic, but then the ending kind of like had a weird preachy soapboxy moment. I felt might not have been necessary. Just while you're on that subject, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, this is a spoiler, but I think this is a really interesting speech, so I'm just going to read it for you real quick. Mm -hmm. So the driver says to Jackie, oh, now you're going to have a go at Jefferson, huh? And he says, my friend, Jefferson's an American saint because he wrote the words, all men are created equal. Words he clearly didn't believe since he allowed his own children to live in slavery. He was a rich wine snob who was sick of paying taxes to the Brits. So yeah, he wrote some lovely words and aroused the rabble. And they went out and died for those words while he sat back and drank his wine and fucked his slave girl. This guy wants to tell me we're living in a community. Don't make me laugh. I'm living in America. And in America, you're on your own. America's not a country. It's just a business. Now fucking pay me. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful line. Beautiful fucking... I do agree that it yeah. is. it does seem like a tonal shift, but at the same time, I do think they hint towards this coming soon with the, like, underpaying him for the killings and with, you know, everyone talking about how things used to be better and how he mm-hmm. talks to uh, Frankie about how, like, a real friend wouldn't let you go to jail for something they did. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they do kind of build up to it, but at the same time, I do agree. It it was a little heavy-handed. We should explore that again when we get into things that didn't work for us. Sure. But, Paul, before we get into that, what did you really like about killing them softly? I really... Love the sawed-off shotgun. That made me laugh so <laughs> fucking hard. Yeah. It's, I, I saw this movie in the theater when it first came out because I love Andrew Dominic and I love Brad Pitt. And I didn't really appreciate it the first time. I've seen it probably five or six times since. And I appreciate it more and more each time I watch it. Um, and this time I watched it with the subtitles on. Mm-hmm. And... I gotta say, the dialogue is pretty fantastically written for the most part. Mm. I didn't hear a lot of, like, cliche or, like, mob movie, like, usual stuff. Mm -hmm. I heard a lot of what I thought was just, like, really well-crafted, interesting-to-listen-to dialogue. I love the dialogue in this movie. Like you mentioned, I love the tension especially in the game robbery. Mm. I thought one of the most effective scenes in the movie besides the drug doing scene was the scene where they beat up Marky, who is Ray Liotta's character. Mm -hmm. That scene is both emotionally and physically brutal because you can see on Ray Liotta's face and you can hear in his whining kind of voice that like, this is really hurting him big time. Yeah. He but did then a really also, good job of getting beat. <laughs> yeah. But then also like when he's like putting his hands up and they're having to like pull his hands down just to get like a straight shot at his face. That was fucking intense. And then the way they have the shutter speed of the camera cranked up. So it's like very like motion blurry. Mm-hmm. Like the hits look really fucking intense. It's just a brutal scene and a really well done one at that. Uh, Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the things I like the best. I love the writing in Brad Pitt's character. I loved both of the big killings in the movie. When he kills Frankie at the very end with the pistol 
and then when he kills, I don't remember that guy's name, but the the guy who gives Frankie the job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the chubby guy, Squirrel. Mm-hmm. When he kills Squirrel, that both of those kills were just so brutal. And oh yeah. So like, Frankie. The first time I saw it, Frankie's killing was super unexpected. Um, because literally all you see is just that gun reaches back into the car and just goes blam. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, just really well done stuff. I, I think most things in this movie worked for me, but those were the things mm-hmm. that kind of stood out as being good. And. To go back to, like I said, the, the weird Clint Eastwood thing of, like, being a cowboy is bad, this sucks, ugh. When you see the violence drawn out like this, the robbery scene drawn out, or the beating drawn out, the deaths drawn out, you get a much better feel of that point of, like, it gets messy, it gets yeah. touchy-feely, because without them having to, like, clock you over the head with it, they they just were very effective at showing you it by slowing down the action by yeah. letting you see the characters suffer yeah. during their beatings and executions, right? Yeah. Especially when Squirrel's getting killed. Like, he's just, like, laying there squirming around, like, about to crawl away, and then just the back just of his head just and... opens up. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so what did not work for you in this movie? Well... Uh, again, I gotta go back to the ending because now that I think about it, when I was watching this movie with Pat, he had mentioned that like it felt to him like Burn After Reading, and I can understand why. Wasn't Burn After Reading also a uh, Coen Brothers fil- uh, film? Yeah, C- Burn After Reading was a Coen Brothers movie. A, you had the same uh, actors, Brad Pitt and Richard Jenkins. Yeah, but their dialogue was more snappy. Right, Brad Pitt's lines were snappy. They were they were very quotable. Yeah. Burn after reading those lines feel very dictated or very they're very crafted to yeah. kind of like go oh you're, you're like that's an interesting way to say that or that's mm-hmm. a very good way of putting that or it strings you along. Those yeah. two talking felt like that. So by the very end when they have like a a sit down and a kind of like big soapboxy thing that was a big tonal shift from the rest of the movie when it was just very gritty. And when they did have those moments, it wasn't doted on. It was just, it felt like more in the moment. These are real people, real characters. This part felt like it was in the ether. It was now here is my message to you all kind of moment. It was like, so So I didn't, I didn't quite appreciate the tonal shift. Well, I do appreciate what was said in his speech, the Thomas Jefferson thing. Yeah, I was very confused when he said because this whole time they're talking about like the boss's name is Dylan, right? Yeah, they talk about Dylan in the car, they talk about Dylan everywhere, and when they says we got to bring it up with Dylan, Brad Pitt just says Dylan died this morning. I was like, was that a threat or did he actually die? And if so, how did you know that? And how come the driver doesn't know that? Because I was like, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, that instantly took me out of it. I said, wait, what? Because there was, there was no back story to that. There was no setup for that. All of a sudden, he's just dead. Sure. That's what jolted me out of the movie. Okay. And for that, I hold it against the ending. Other than that, I really don't have any other complaints. I can see if someone might think that this movie's a little too long. But, for like I said, I appreciate the time it takes. It's almost shot like a Western, a Western slash crime movie, right? Mm -hmm. Because of how how much time they take in kind of setting up the landscape, the characters, and uh, everything. I appreciate that a lot. I love Westerns, but I can see if someone would say that this might be too long. Paul, was there anything that you didn't quite like about this? Um... I personally didn't have a problem with the Dylan thing uh, just because of the fact that I whether or not Dylan did die, which I mean, I think he did in like real in the in the movie world. Um, I think it's Brad Pitt's way of saying, like, I'm not the guy you usually get to do this shit. I set my own prices and you have to give me the money I'm asking for. So that that worked for me. But also. I understand why it it might have felt like it was out of the blue. For me, the only... uh, 
Yeah, I tried to think of things that didn't work for me or things that, like, took me out of the movie, but I really, like, I've seen this movie five or six times at this point, and this time, if anything, I was more enthralled by it than I was previously, just by virtue of the fact that I could hear the dialogue better while I was reading it, if that makes sense. Were there any scenes that... Yeah, that does make sense, actually. Were there any scenes that you think you could have said they could have tightened up or they could have touched up on or something? No, I, like, quite liked the pace of this movie a lot. And I think Mm -hmm. the fact that it doesn't try and, like, over-explain or, like, give you too much context, or if it does, it's a little more subtle. It's, like, conversational in a way that feels real. Mm Mm-hmm really sang for me for some reason. So I, I think, I mean, not to, cause I already am an unabashed lover of, uh, the assassination of Jesse James. And I really love this movie too. I think I might just be a fan of the way Andrew Dominic puts a movie together. Damn. I must've missed something in Jesse James. Cause I did not see these two toe to toe. This movie has so well, much no, more. Well, no, I think they're very different. I'm just saying, like, they're both made by the same guy, and they're both two of my favorite movies. But even when I try to think about the way that the story was kind of strung along, maybe it's because there's a narration. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are very different about it. But yeah. I don't know. I I can't think of anything I didn't like about this movie, although I totally understand if someone didn't like it. Because I, what do you I, think someone wouldn't like about this movie? Because I mean, the only I thing think, I can think of is the the pace and the the length. I mean, I think one of the things that bothers me about people who like like mob movies, I guess, is that like they want people the will be apologists for like shitty movies just because they have some good aspects of like mob movie in them. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, like for example. This comedian, John Mulaney, has this bit about Scarface and how Scarface is just a fucking trash, awful piece of shit movie. And yet, for some reason, people put it in the same league as, like, The Godfather because occasionally in Scarface there are great scenes of good direction and great acting and great subtlety. But as John Mulaney finishes off his bit, it's a bit like saying my favorite foods are lobster and Skittles. Like lobster just has so much more sub. like the Godfather is just so much greater of a movie than Scarface. And I feel like a lot of really shitty mob movies get the Scarface treatment where it's like, Oh, they might have something interesting or new or good about them and so people put them way up high with movies like the godfather which are just masterpieces and this movie i think is the opposite where it's like it's so subtle it's got all of these well fleshed out characters and all of these heavy emotions and you see why every, or you don't see objectively why everyone's doing what they're doing, but you feel like you get a good sense for why people are doing stuff and what kind of lives they lead and stuff like that. But it's subtle. It's not like hitting you over the head with it. And yet mm-hmm. on, I don't know if it was Metacritic or, oh, on cinema score, which is like this audience rates, the movie aggregator type website. It has an average grade of an F. Yeah, I was I was gonna ask because why like, you think people would not like this? Because yeah, this has I a don't 6. understand. On because IMDb, to me, this is like, a, just a high quality movie. Yeah, and I I don't know. So I, I, I am I'm in agreement because when I saw that score, I'm like, I don't see how I I'm missing something because I enjoyed this throughout. Yeah, I really enjoyed the heck out of it. It's very well stylized. It was yeah. very gritty. It was. It felt very real. The acting was absolutely on point. How Scoot, whatever his name is, didn't get accolades for this. Uh, Scoot McNary, the guy who played Frankie, how he didn't get accolades for this movie, I will never know because this movie is just absolutely fantastic. 
Yeah, I, I'm. I'm shocked. I have no idea why this movie has such a bad score. Yeah, but we can take solace in the fact that not only is Scoop McNary continuing to act with Brad Pitt uh, in Brad Pitt's upcoming movie War Machine, but Andrew Dominic is uh, continuing to make movies. Um, Hmm. continuing with the movie uh, War Party, which should be coming out in the next few years here. Now, so, do you think maybe they didn't like it because the audience they attracted with um, Brad Pitt didn't like this movie? Cause I, yeah, like I think people Brad were expecting like a like much this. more violent kind of like, uh, you know, yeah, harrowing type of movie. And I don't remember how if this was advertised or if it was. I don't remember how it was advertised. But I just remember reading about it and reading about it being based on this really crazy book about like being a mobster as the economy turns down. So, right. I mean, I don't know. I can only assume people are expecting more of a thriller. And I mean, to the audience's credit, I do remember this happening with that movie, The American, starring George Clooney, which, like, The American was advertised as, like, this fucking insane action movie that takes place all over Italy and stuff. And when you went to go see it, it was literally an art film about this aging assassin who doesn't want to do what he does anymore. So it's like, I understand. I mean, false advertising does get people quite a lot. I think that has to be it. Because I can see how one would mistake this movie, just seeing the poster alone, killing them softly. Yeah. With, like, handsome Brad Pitt holding a shotgun. Might think, this might be something else. Or this might a be a shoot Brad up. Pitt kind of movie. Yeah, but it was neither of those things. Yeah, and so yeah, exactly. with that in their head, they might not liked it. But if any of you out there listening, ooh, watch this movie and didn't like it, I'd like to hear your reasons why, because yeah, so would I, I want to know. I would like to know how out of touch I am. <laughs> yeah, what what did I not see that bothered you, or that you know? Right, I'd right. be very interested to hear. My Twitter handle is yeah. at Paul underscore J underscore Morgan. So just DM me or tweet at me. Tell me what sucked about this movie. Why am I an idiot for liking it? Um, so Anson, would you recommend this movie? Yeah, I would. And then even I, I even recommend this out of the morbid curiosity of you tell me why you didn't like it after you see it, because yeah. I'm not of the popular opinion, and I really don't find mm, any critique for me. Actually, if you don't like crime movies, you're not going to like this, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Straight off out the gate. But yeah. why would you watch a movie called Killing Them Softly about mafia stuff if you don't like crime movies? So, exactly. I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it to you, whoever the hell you are, but everyone else, yeah, give this a watch. Yeah. And how about you, Paul? Uh, yeah, I recommend this. And I've actually had good experiences recommending this. I've told some friends to see it, and they enjoyed it. So, Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, well. I guess with that, this has been uh, Anson and Paul's Big Movie Podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be back next time with, some, with two more movies. Yes, sir. And uh, I guess until then. I have been Anson Chan. And I've been Paul Morgan. And we'll see you guys next time. Yeah.